I pray for a special endowment of power from up on high. For I cannot teach without your anointing. I cannot minister to the needs of your people without the anointing. For the anointing breaks the yoke. Let me present Jesus and Jesus only. Let me present your word and word only. And let it come through these lips to set the captives free. I pray for revelation knowledge and spiritual truths. I rebuke Satan and bind any obscuring spirits that would try to block the word of God. And I command the deaf ears and the blind eyes to be opened to the word of God. And I loose the warring angels around the sanctuary tonight to, to, to wield the word of God against any enemies that would try to come in and to deceive the children of God. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Tonight, we're going to start studying about the Holy Spirit and prayer. In other words, his job in the prayer. Because in reality, we are co-laborers with God. I know that may sound odd to you, but that's exactly, in reality, what we are. Now, of course, this is a continuation of the lessons on intercession, which takes you directly into spiritual warfare. Now, if you would turn with me, please, to John chapter 14. And I'm using the Amplified here because the Amplified really gives it good here. John chapter 14, verse 16. And Jesus is saying, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another comforter. He's talking about the Holy Spirit here. And of course, the Amplified, as you well know, expounds upon, due to the, the, because the Greek cannot be totally translated as we, in, in, in English. So he's saying here, he will give you another comforter, counselor, helper, intercessor, advocate, strengthener, and standby. And he may remain with you forever. In other words, the Holy Spirit is just much more than, a whole, than, the, than the Holy Spirit. He's our comforter. He's our counselor. Counselor is what? It's like an attorney at law, isn't he? He counsels us. He's our helper. He helps us in the things of God. He's our intercessor. In other words, he intercedes for us on our behalf. He's our advocate. He's our friend. He's our strengthener. And he's always our, he's our standby. And then again in verse 26, the same chapter, but the comforter, counselor, helper, intercessor, advocate, strengthener, standby, and Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, in my place, to represent me, and do what? Act on my behalf. He will teach you all things, and he will cause you to recall, will remind you, bring to your remembrance everything I have told you. And then again in verse 15, or, I'm sorry, ch chapter 15, verse 26. But when the comforter, the counselor, the helper, the advocate, intercessor, strengthener, standby comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who comes or proceeds from the Father, he himself will testify regarding me. And then again in uh, chapter 16, verse 7, the Lord says, However, I am telling you nothing but the truth. When I say it is profitable, it is good, expedient, it's advantageous for you that I go away, because if I do not go away, the Comforter, your Counselor, your Helper, your Advocate, your Intercessor, your Strengthener and Standby will not come to you into close fellowship with you, but if I go away, I will send him to you to be in close fellowship with you. So, that's a pretty good description of the Holy Spirit. I've done a good job there. Now, one of the areas, if you notice here, in which he helps us is, to, is in prayer. Especially intercessory prayer. The Bible calls him a spirit of prayer in Zechariah 12.10. Because one of his major functions is to teach us how to pray and to help us as we do. Any effective prayer life must be founded upon a de dependence upon the helper within. 
without the aid of God's indwelling spirit, intercessory prayer would be a vain exercise. This does not relinquish our responsibility uh, in the matter. He is called a helper. Why? Because he helps us to pray. He doesn't do the praying for us while we sleep or think about other things, does he? It'd be nice if he did, but he doesn't. It doesn't work that way. We are the ones who are to pray diligently. But she, you see, the fact remains that we need help from God's Spirit in order to pray effectively. You see, that it's, it, it's primarily so that every blow delivered in prayer is made to count. And you'll see why in just a minute. The Holy Spirit directs us as to what to pray for, and he shows us how we should pray. In this way, we can become co-laborers with God in the realm of prayer. Our responsibility lies in overcoming the flesh's inclination not to pray, because your flesh don't like to pray. You don't want to get up and pray. And, of course, yielding ourselves to the Spirit within us as he urges us, us to intercede. Although you'll find as you do it more and inter pray more and intercede more, the easier and easier and easier it becomes. And you'll think, man, I have missed the boat for so many years. You'll, you really will. You really will. The Spirit of God it is sent to help us to pray because of our weakness. Say that word. Weakness. This weakness consists of our not knowing what to pray for, nor how to pray. I'm going to show you that in the Word here. Let's turn to Romans chapter 20. I'm sorry, Romans chapter 8. Hallelujah. Romans 8, verse 26. Again, I've got the Amplified. <clears throat> Everybody got it there? Okay. So too, the Holy Spirit comes to aid and bears us up in our weakness. Now, didn't, what did I just talk about? Weakness. For we do not know what prayer to offer, nor how to offer it worthily, as we ought. But the Spirit himself goes to meet our supplication and pleads in our behalf with unspeakable yearnings and groanings too deep for utterance. And I'll cover that groanings and yearnings. If you haven't got into that yet, you haven't been praying long enough. Because you sure will. And he, that's God, who searches the hearts of men knows what is in the mind of the Holy Spirit what his intent is. Because the Spirit intercedes and pleads before God in behalf of the saints according to and in harmony with God's will. How many of you would always like to pray God's will? How would you like to pray God's will on your life? How would you like to be able to pray God's will on her life? Pray in the Spirit. It tells you right there in the Word. Because you see, you don't know how to pray as you ought. Only God knows her heart, or her heart, or your heart. See, she doesn't know your heart, or you don't know her heart, but God does. So what does God do? He reads your heart, connects his will with it, and then brings it to pass. Amen. That's how it works. So you see, any believer who desires to be effective in intercession must acknowledge his utter dependence upon God's Spirit. I mean, if you think about it, it's a step of faith just to speak in tongues, isn't it? It's a step of faith to, to, to pray in the Spirit. You're just, you're just there and you're on your knees, you're on your face or whatever you might be doing, praising God and, 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 and you're, you're speaking in tongues, you're, you're speaking in your heavenly language. It's a step of faith. Because you, I mean, down deep you think, oh gee, I hope God's hearing me. He's hearing you, don't worry. It's a heavenly language. They only, hear it, they only hear it one place, up there. You know why they call it a heavenly language? So the devil can't understand it. 
You speak in the natural? You got the little, little, little friends of his listening to you to plan his strategies and deceits. Because he knows, you see, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So when, you, out, when you're speaking in English like that, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. They say, oh, I know what her weakness is. I'm going to beat her on the head with it. That's what happens. That's an intercession. Now, you see, we need the help of the Holy Spirit so that we can overcome our weakness and pray effectively. Because you see, when God sent the Comforter, He not only sent the Comforter, He sent our Counselor, our Helper, our Intercessor, our Advocate, our Strengthener, and our Standby, didn't He? Praise you, Father. You see, the Spirit helps us by interceding for us with unutterable groanings. What is that? What is that? When you get into real, true, deep intercession, you'll find out. It normally hits you about your, in your, about your third hour. About your third hour. And it's just like somebody that hits you in the gut. That's what it, what it feels like. Because we've experienced it. You see, the, the Spirit helps us by interceding with, uh, for us with unutter, unutterable groanings because Paul mentioned this kind of gro of groaning in regard to creation. You see, all creation groans longing to be freed from the corruption which came when Adam fell. In Romans 8.22, the word says, For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption and to the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. In other words, travail. The whole earth is in travail right now. He also speaks of Christians groaning as they long and desire for the redemption of their physical bodies. In 2 Corinthians 5, 2 and 4, it says... For indeed, this house we groan. This house being the body we live in. Longing to be clothed in our dwelling from heaven, in our resurrected body. For indeed, while we are in this tent, in this body, we groan being burdened because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed in order that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. 2 Corinthians 5, 2 and 4. Praise you, Father. You see, in the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness. In the same way in which the Spirit helps us with inward groanings. As He longs for the will of God to be accomplished and so intercedes within us. This will not occur without our cooperation. The Spirit helps us to do the job. Isn't He our helper? Hallelujah. You see, He doesn't do the job for us. The, the Greek word here translated help in this particular package, uh, passage means to take hold with another who is laboring, who is travailing. That's an intercessor. The Spirit helps us by taking hold with us with inward groanings and yearnings to see God's will accomplished. But we must cooperate with the Helper and yield ourselves to Him. It is only as we do our part that we will receive the help of God's Spirit. We must take the initiative and intercession by taking hold in prayer. Only then can the Spirit take a hold of us. Hallelujah. You see, the Holy Spirit knows God's will, doesn't He? The weakness that every believer faces in prayer is one of ignorance. Because, see, we don't know how or what to pray for as we should. But the Holy Spirit knows everything about God, doesn't he? In 1 Corinthians 2.11, 1 
The Lord says, For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the spirit of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the spirit of God. Hallelujah. Praise you, Father. You see, he also searches the hearts and knows what the mind of the spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to God's will as we just read in, in uh, Romans 8, 27, which says, And he who searches the hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because he intercedes for the, the saints according to the will of God. Praying God's will. Now, I've got too many Bibles up here. And... Ephesians chapter 6, 18. Oops. In Ephesians 6, 18. Of course, this is Paul. And Paul says, in the Amplified here, pray it at all times, on every occasion, in every season, in the Spirit with all manner of prayer and entreaty. To that end, keep alert and watch with strong purpose and perseverance, interceding in behalf of all the saints, God's consecrated people, interceding for the saints. And in Jude, Jude is the last page before Revelations, chapter 20, or actually just verse 20, <clears throat> The word says, but you, beloved, build yourselves up, founded on your most holy faith. Make progress, rise like an edifice, higher and higher, praying in the Holy Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit edifies. And the word edify means build up. So when you're praying in the Holy Spirit, Excuse me. You are building up your spirit. Your, in other words, you're building up your spirit to get stronger and stronger. Your inner man, your spirit man, is, will, is overcoming your flesh. Now, if you notice, both of the scriptures refer to a believer praying how? In the spirit. In tongues. In tongues. Now, the devil has really used this particular scripture right here in 1 Corinthians 14, 14 in the Amplified. It says, If I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit, by the Holy Spirit within me, prays, but my mind is unproductive. How many of you read that one before? You remember when we were all filled with the Holy Spirit and you said, but what does that mean? My mind is unproductive. Well, God doesn't want your mind to be productive when you're praying in the Holy Spirit. He wants control. He wants control. A man is a, a body, a soul, and a spirit. When we're born again, you've heard me say this before, but when you're born again, your spirit, of course, is instantly new creation. Your mind, of course, has to be renewed to the Word of God. And your body has, is, is always unrenewed and stays that way. So your spirit man rises above your flesh. Hallelujah. Praise your Father. On the day of Pentecost, the disciples were filled with the Spirit and began to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. It's in Acts 2 and 4. The Spirit of God was enabling them to speak in a language unknown to any of them. 
In the same way, when we pray in tongues, we are allowing the Spirit of God to pray through us in a language that our minds do not comprehend. A heavenly language. That heavenly language is for God's heavenly people in it. Why? So that the enemy will not understand us. You're praying God's perfect will. You are praying directly to God. In 1 Corinthians 14, 2, excuse me. In 1 Corinthians 14 and 2, how many of you would like to talk directly to God? Hmm? 1 Corinthians 14 and 2, didn't I? Thank you, Jesus. Jesus. But if your gift is that of being able to speak in tongues, that is, this is a living, that is to speak in languages you haven't learned, you will be talking to God but not to others since they won't be able to understand you. You will be speaking by the power of the Spirit but it will all be a secret. You see, for one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but he speaks to God. No one understands that his Spirit speaks mysteries. So, you see, not only is praying in tongues an excellent way to worship and give thanks to God, you're talking directly to God, you're, talking, you're, you're, you're praying God's perfect will, but it is also a means of intercession. You see, by praying in the Spirit, or in other tongues, we release our spirit to pray directly to God by the Helper who is within. We pray mysteries to the Father, prayers that are in accordance with His will. We are the ones doing the speaking, but the Spirit within is the one who is directing and orchestrating the mysteries which we speak to the Father. Praying in tongues is a way in which we can release ourselves to the Helper within and allow Him to use us in praying according to God's perfect will. You see, the devil tries to blind people to that. The devil doesn't want you praying in the Spirit. The devil doesn't, why? He doesn't want you talking to God. That's that simple. He don't want you talking to God. He doesn't want God's will to be upon the earth. And that's how it's brought to pass, through the prayers of the saints. Hallelujah. You see, whether by groaning from deep within or by prayer in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit is our helper in the realm of intercession. No real intercession can take place without a total reliance on this source of power and insight. Only as we tap the resources that God has put at our disposal will we really and truly become effective in prayer. But the way to tap these resources must be learned. If one's prayer life is um, just once in a while, with only occasional times or seasons of prayer, um, he'll never come to understand how the Spirit helps in intercession. But when a believer diligently gives himself to prayer on a regular basis, regular basis, and I don't mean five or ten minutes, and we're talking intercession here, then he'll begin to understand more and more about the kind of help the Holy Spirit will give. God talks about intercession as seasons. He's not talking, not even, he's talking more than an hour. He's normally talking two to three. You say, two to three? That's right. Your flesh don't like that. <laughs> Our flesh don't like it. Hallelujah. Intercession is not just a simple formula. You cannot master it in a matter of minutes. It is an art and it must be learned with time. 
This does not mean that our prayers are ineffective while we are learning. It simply indicates that the way to a deeper understanding of prayer is through practice. You start with a few minutes a day, 10 minutes, then you go to 20, go to 30, then go to an hour. You get up an hour every morning, and then go to two. In our own personal, personal prayer lives, I think I've told you this before, we, we pray two hours every morning and one hour every night. And I cannot tell you how or what that does to you. It's absolutely wonderful because you're entering in to what you're created to be. So try it. You'll like it. <laughs> try it. Praise God. You see, you can receive volumes, and you can read books, and you can have umpteen teachers up here uh, teaching on the subject. But until you put it into operation, he has learned, or you've learned, very little. But if you will diligently practice the art of intercession, you'll gain a deeper insight into how the Holy Spirit can make your prayer life more and more effective. But you have to do it. The time is coming very shortly. I cannot express to you the importance of this teaching, praying, and praying in the Spirit. This time is coming very shortly that you're going to need it. Praise you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Every believer, whether you realize it or not, is involved in a spiritual war. You're in the war. And it's a war in which there is no neutrality. There's no middle, my dear people. Jesus said in Matthew 12 and 30, He who is not with me is against me. It's either black or white, positive or negative, Satan or God. There is no middle. And a lot of people, you'd be surprised, need that revelation. Why? It's because our mind comes into it and they think, well, that's me. That's me doing this. Or that's me doing that. Nothing works without an outside force involved with it. Nothing. Something in the spiritual realm, negative or positive, and if you think about it, look around you in the world, your home, your family, if it's negative or it's positive, there's no middle. So when that happens, negative or positive, just look at it and you'll know the source. Jesus. You must remember that there are no um, non-combatants in this war. You're in the army now. You've, that's right. You have been drafted. You're drafted. A believer cannot decide that he wants no part in it. The very fact that he is a child of God makes him part of it. The very fact. If he chooses to ignore the spiritual conflict raging around him, he will simply become a casualty in the war. Maybe not directly, but something or someone 